Well, welcome to the podcast, Dana. How are you? I'm awesome. It's Friday. It's a beautiful day, so I'm really good. How are you? I'm doing excellent, man. I had a little bit of a little bit of emergency right before we started here. I told you the sun was coming in a different angle in my house it never has before, and but we're good. We got it all set. I think we're uh, I think we're all right. Awesome. Good deal. Yes. So you're in Wisconsin. I am, and you used to live in Wisconsin. Thirty-eight years. Love it. Thirty-eight. No kidding. What took yeah. you out to Arizona? Well, if I spun my camera around and I showed you what the weather was like right now, that's what brought us to, that's what brought us to Arizona. So yes. born and raised, both my wife and I, we lived to, um, well, we lived together now, but we lived, we grew up together. Uh, okay. So we were both born and raised in Wisconsin and my wife really did not like winter. I love, I didn't mind winter up until the end of January because then hunting was done, bow hunting. Yep. And then I wanted to not be winter anymore. Well, one year, it had been 2013, March of 2013, we visited some friends that lived, that moved from Iowa to Phoenix, Arizona. And I, you know, I, if you don't know, um, if you're from the Midwest and climate, temperature, uh, humidity is all unfamiliar to you, you're only used to what you're used to in Wisconsin. Right, yep. I kept wondering in my mind, like, why would my friends move to Arizona? Because I would see the national weather. Yeah. And in the summer of Wisconsin, it might be 90 degrees, but 90% humidity and you're miserable. Yeah. Yes. And I would see national weather in Phoenix and it was 110. I'm like, how could they do that? Not understanding, you know, dry climate and all that. Well, we visited March of 2013. We flew out of a snowstorm out of Minneapolis. <laughs> we landed here in Phoenix. We went to spring break or spring training games. I never was in a jacket or anything. We were swimming, playing baseball. We spent seven days out here with them. We flew back into a snowstorm. Oh, so it was an easy sell. <laughs> and my wife looked at me one day and she goes, why are we living here when we can live anywhere? And I'm like, I had just bought a hundred acres of land, my own hunting land. Oh, and I'm like, yeah. well, this is where we grew up. Why would we ever move? By July, we were living in Arizona. It was that <laughs> March to July. It was that, I, I, so, and you know, here was the deal with my wife and I, it was, of course, I want her to be happy and, and, and yeah. all this stuff. And I'm like, well, here's the deal. Let's go. My oldest was eight years old at the time. He's now 15. So we're like, our kids are so young. If we're ever going to do it, now is the time. And the deal is, if either one of us is unhappy, we're going to give it two years. Yep. Either one of us is unhappy. The other has to agree to just come back. And she's like, deal. And I'm like, deal. And we've been here seven years and I don't plan on moving Dang. back. I don't think I blame you. So yeah. that's something to look into. I heard Strawberry, Arizona is a place to be too. So beautiful. That's beautiful. Is uh, it? Every, everywhere in Arizona has got its own uniqueness. Of course, you always have to take the good with the bad, no matter where yeah. you live. You know, the, the, the summers here are hot um, and really hot. And you just, you just kind of, but here's the thing. They don't stop doing sports. You don't stop doing outside stuff. You, you still mm -hmm. do it as opposed to when it's so cold in Wisconsin, you really can't do anything, but inside yeah. stuff. And yeah. my wife just felt trapped for six months out of the year. And so here we just feel like we're outside. We, we play sports year round outside and the hunting, and just living. Oh, yeah. And the hunting in Arizona is world-class. A lot of opportunities. So oh, actually I tell all the non-resident, my non-resident friends, the hunting here is terrible. You don't ever want to come here. And don't worry about it. Stay, stay where you're at. So, but did tell us, up, yeah, yeah, go ahead. What, uh, did you end up selling your hundred acres? I did. You know, my plan was um, we, when we moved, because we moved so fast, we still had a house that we owned in Wisconsin and my land. And we flew to Arizona and we leased a house. We thought it'd be best. We had some good advice from some friends that had moved cross country before. So we leased a house because we didn't know where we wanted to live. Thankfully, because we moved out of that little town, it was just north of Arizona, uh, Phoenix called Anthem, nice little community. And we put our house up for sale and we had a really beautiful custom stone house in Wisconsin and it just wasn't selling, wasn't selling, wasn't selling. And I told my wife, I'm like, I really don't want to sell the land because we had the availability to travel quite a bit in, in yep. a lot of free time. And I thought, well, I'll just go back every year for the rut. My brother lives there, he, you know, my, my ranger and all my stuff is there and, and he gets to hunt it and he'll take care of it. And I went back that first year, four days. And then I, you know, my, my kids were getting older, they're in sports, you know, it just, it gets busier. And the next year sure. I didn't even really get to go back. So we put it up for sale and it sold immediately and I made really good really? money on it. Yeah. So I made good money on it. And, uh, but it was hard, you know, I, I had it for about two years and put food plots in. I was out there almost every day, you know, work in the land and really yeah. I was doing something. Yep. yep. It's all sold. And then our house finally sold. And 
Cool. Here we are. All, it all fell together just the way it was supposed to. Just the way it was supposed to. Yeah. So how about you? Tell me about yourself. You know, this is the first time we've gotten a chance. We've had a little bit of communication through social media. I am a member yep. of your page, which I think is awesome. We'll talk about that. And I'm excited okay. to hear more about it in depth. And uh, you're the first female guest that I've had on the Fit Archer podcast. So that's yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm well, excited, I'm excited about that. Take that. Uh, yeah, I'll take that. That's all. That's really awesome. That's really unique too. So a little bit about me. I am, well, I was born and raised in La Crosse, Wisconsin. So you're from Wisconsin. I'm, I'm from La Crosse. <laughs> that's where we lived. I was going to yeah. ask you, Dana, if you were related to any of the Seishas in Holman, because I used to know some of the Seishas. I'm not actually, I was married into the Sage family and they were not a apple orchard family either. Okay. So yeah. So I, I was born and raised in La Crosse. I lived there my entire life. And then when I turned uh, 24 is when uh, we actually moved out to Melrose, which is where I still live now. And it's funny because at that time when I was, you know, back then in La Crosse city wasn't even considered city. It was, I don't even know what you would call it, but it wasn't really that fast paced, but moving out 40 minutes away from town, I thought like it was going to, it was like a terrible for me. It was like a really hard transition. And then it didn't take very long for me to understand why people move out to the country. And so I kind of consider myself a city girl gone country because my lifestyle there was different versus what it was when we moved out to the country. And at that time I was married and my husband at ex-husband at the time was um, building houses. And so we bought a chunk of land and then uh, we built a house there and then we sectioned off the rest of the land and then we just built spec houses on, on the property. But just from being there, um, being out in you know the country in that feel, it, it doesn't take very long. Just like it probably didn't take very long for you to get accustomed to something that made your soul feel really good out in Arizona. And so we, my husband at the time was a hunter and I wasn't. And so we bought a, a chunk of land of 73 acres and we'd go out there and he'd hunt and we'd camp and you know have bonfires and we loved all of that. But I just really wasn't just still didn't understand the hunting piece of it and I had two boys and they were getting to that point where they were wanting to hunt and stuff like that and so um, I'm like how you know I need to find a way that I can connect with my two kids on a deeper value than when they would come back with a pheasant or something they're just little they're so excited and I was always putting on the fake mom smile like oh good job honey but I like didn't really get it you know and so when my oldest turned 12, I, he was going to go take hunter safety. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to go with you. Like I could probably turkey hunt. Like that would probably be okay with me. And so I went and got my hunter safety. And I always say it's the first test in my whole life that I aced. So I'm like, it's my calling. I'm like, I'm all in. <laughs> Not that it's a very difficult test, but for me, I'm like, I got something. So um, instead of turkey hunting, I, I ended up deciding that I wanted to, uh, to whitetail hunt. And at that time, I really wasn't into getting up early and, and I didn't understand why people did that and all those things. And I thought, who wants to go freeze outside? And I just didn't understand it at all. And so my ex at the time built me a, a hunting shack. And it was, um, I don't know, it was probably 15, I don't know, it was tall, probably 15 feet off the ground. And, um, and so I remember like the very first time that I ended up going hunting by myself, it literally, I still recognize it as the day that like changed my life, transformed me forever. And I, at that time in my life, um, I was, I really, I owned a business and so I was working 24 seven and I had two busy kids and a husband and employees and clients and candidates and everything was just always busy, 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 busy. And so for me, when that first day that I literally like got up in that stand by myself and it was transformational because I remember like looking out on the field and realizing in that moment, like I own 73 acres, but I never really knew what I had and something just happened to me. And it was the coolest couple of hours that I ever had. I sat there all by myself and it was just so neat because there was turkeys out in the field um, there was doe playing and you could literally like see the little fawns and the doe playing and like they would run at each other and they kind of jump up and they like tag each other. And it was like, almost like I could hear him saying, tag, you're it. You know, it was just like so fun to watch that. 
And the sunset that night, I remember, was like one of the most stunning things I'd ever seen. And I almost got emotional because I thought, I've owned this piece of property for a couple of years and never felt the gratitude in my soul about what I actually owned. I just seen it as a place to go camping and a place to hang out. But in that moment, it was just like everything slowed down for me. The phone wasn't ringing. The kids weren't, you know, blah, 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 blah. and, um, you know, just it was calm. It was a peaceful like environment that I hadn't felt or seen or experienced in a really long time. But above and beyond that, the the beauty of what I was seeing was so captivating that I was just mesmerized by something so extraordinary. And it was something that I already owned and I never really looked at it from a view of up 15 feet in the air. And um, that night, um, it was really the first time that I hunted by myself. I It was getting to be the, the hunting time when you know the sun is setting and, and a very nice uh, big 10 point buck come to the edge of the woods. And you could literally see him just looking out like, should I or shouldn't I? And he was just so cautious and he took out like one step and he was just so slow. But I remember he was so big and so massive. And I was thinking in my head, like I should be grabbing my gun. I should be grabbing my gun. But instead I just was so moved by like the whole night. I'm like, I just, I just want to watch this guy and see what he does. And it was so cool to watch him just cautiously step out into the field and he, every step that he took, you could like literally feel his manlyhood. I don't know how to describe it, but he was so stout and he just acted like he just owned the whole property. And I was just like so in awe by witnessing that. I'd never really seen that before. And he was just like super cautious. He didn't want to come too far out into the field. And so instead of grabbing my gun, which I really had to think about, because I'm like, if I come home and my husband knows that there was 10 points. <laughs> Out there and I didn't shoot he's probably gonna give me a hard time but instead I just I'm like I'm just gonna enjoy this moment um and I'm gonna take it all in and while I was sitting there uh watching this beautiful buck I realized in that moment like I had a lot to learn and I thought okay I'm gonna make a decision right here today that I'm not gonna harvest my first buck until I see one that's bigger than this guy because I knew that was a really big buck and I thought this will give me time to enjoy what I've been missing out on, learn some more experience, gain some patience, and, and just really take it all in, spend more time with my kids out in the woods. And so that's what I did. And I actually hunted three seasons. I waited three seasons until I found a buck that was bigger than that one that day. And I used that as a way to really just enhance my own ability to to find patients. Cause at that time in my life, I didn't have a lot of them with so much going on. And um, so three years later, I was able to harvest my first buck and it was an 11 point buck. So it was well worth waiting for. But what I've learned through that experience is that really good things are worth waiting for. You know, it's so easy to want to pull the trigger on things. And um, I was so grateful that I didn't because three years later, after hunting all those times, all those sits, all of those experiences, it made that moment so much more enjoyable, so much more like literally a thousand fireworks going off in every direction, the sky and my emotion and my everything. And um, that's like something I'll never forget, like ever. That first time I hunted, the first time I harvested my first buck, like that is just something that's really super special to me. And um, it's taught me a lot and most importantly that good things are worth waiting for and it usually trumps your expectations so that was a really cool experience for me once I got started but what it did is it set something off inside of me that was like what's next <laughs> so then I just started kind of really making a list of things that I really wanted to accomplish and things I wanted to achieve um, personally but also um, from hunting and I um, the first thing that I really started really being captivated with was mule deer. Like I just, I was so mesmerized by them. I was just like, so taken back. They're so similar, but so different. And, and so um, a couple of years later, I had an awesome opportunity to go out to Wyoming. I went to Dave Nelson's Outfitters in Sheridan, Wyoming. And um, I went there all by myself. And um, I was able to harvest my first mule deer out there. And it was just a really, really special experience for me to go by myself. Um, I'm a very goal-driven woman. So when I set a goal, I just I focus on how I'm going to achieve it. And 
opportunities sometimes just come about and this this one did and um i came home and i posted about it and at that time there was a magazine called girls guns and rods and um they had reached out to me and asked if i wanted to write an article for their magazine and that opened up another um awesome opportunity so then i ended up writing for them for a couple of years before they sold their magazine so just hunting in its entirety is can be so meaningful so spiritual so inspirational such a lesson teacher <laughs> there's so many things you have to learn and so many ups and downs that come with it and um i feel like those are all things that are part of personal growth and so for me that gets me really excited but i just feel like hunting can open up a lot of doors and you meet so many amazing people and um yeah, so I don't know, that just kind of led me to, to that goal and, and then to the next one. And so I've been really blessed to be able to harvest some really amazing animals. I've gone hog hunting. Um, I've gone um, bear hunting. I went to Idaho bear hunting uh, two or three years ago and it was a, a spot and stock hunt. So it was a very difficult hunt and we experienced every single up and down measure you could possibly imagine. It was a spring hunt. And we went through rainstorms and snowstorms and super cold weather and 13 hour hiking days and up the mountain, down the mountain. We actually got stuck on the mountain overnight one night, no gear, no nothing. Uh, we had to spend, all we had literally was a fire. It was just a really rough night. And, um, but my, my trip had, um, ended uh, actually, I think it was like on a Friday and my guide said, you know, you have put so much time in, you've hunted so hard. He, I think he, he must have felt sorry for me because he's like, I really want to get you a bear. And so he gave me two more days. So I changed all my plans, rerouted my airplane, um, made out different arrangements with my kids and with work. And at the, the last day, at the last minute, literally at the last second, it all came together and this beautiful cinnamon bear came out and um i'd actually told my guide i said i'm just going to be very honest with you i said i've never bear hunted and i think bears are probably one of the most majestic animals that roam and i said i don't know i might have a minute where i may not be able to pull the trigger like i just don't know and i'll know in that moment and um and thankfully, when he showed up, I think after all the struggles, I was like, I'm not leaving here without him, especially a cinnamon. He was so stunning. He was just gorgeous. And so thankfully, you know, I was able to put a you know, kill shot on him. And man, it was just um, such a such an awesome experience. And then again, you know, all the struggles, the valleys and the peaks and the highs and the lows, like if I would have rolled up there and shot him on or harvested him on the first day, it wouldn't have meant the same to me as all of the things we went through and all the ups and downs and the emotions that came with it and then that last minute you know it's just like oh my goodness it's just it's a blessing and you just that those are things like you just can't experience through money or a vehicle or um you know you just can't i, I don't think you can i know other people might compare it to that but to me those are raw emotions and um, experiences and growth that you just can't experience unless you do it yourself and go through it. Well, you paint an incredible picture. You're an incredible storyteller. And I love that because it, I'm able to put myself in the, I'm able to put myself in the stand with you and watch that buck that you didn't harvest. You know, you're, my mind is going hundred miles an hour with questions and, and all. And I, and I, I want to even go back to, we probably know a ton of the same people. For some reason, I thought you were way down Southern Arizona because when I first learned of you, it was through Art Helen. Oh, yeah. Art. So I lived in. So going back, I lived in La Crosse um, when yeah. I gra I graduated Mauston High School. Okay. So just down the interstate a little ways, and then yeah. I went to college in La Crosse and and lived in La Crosse until 1990. Well, well, I'm sorry, not 1993. That's when I graduated until 2013 when we moved. So. I know a ton of people all through there. My land was between West Salem and Melrose. Oh my God. That's yeah, that's so where my funny. land was. So um, I was going to ask you how old you are, but I know I'm not supposed to do that. But I probably know a bunch of people from Melrose that you know. So you probably do. I graduated in 93 as well. So I'm sure we do. <laughs> uh, so my one of my good friends um, married Christy Barilani. Okay. Do you remember I her? I don't know if I know Christy. She might have been a couple years younger. She might be a couple years younger than you. Tony Fisher. Do you remember the Fisher brothers? I know Tony. Yeah, he wrestled on, on, at UW Lacrosse, him and his brother. Yeah, yep. that's how I got to know Tony. And I remember him always talking about some of his land that he had. 
He had some, he might've been a couple years younger than you, than us though, correct? Um, I think he actually has land right outside of Melrose here. Okay. So um, I think he is maybe 43 or 44, I yeah, would I think. He might've been a year, maybe coming a year after I did. My brother's a, uh, a deputy sheriff in La Crosse really? County. So he travels all through your area. And, What's uh, his I, name? Uh, Brandon Pensover. Brandon. Okay. Yeah. I'm not all right. really does much over the road anymore. He'll correct me because he listens to all the podcasts. He'll say, oh, I'm still over the road. I, I don't, I, th I don't think he works much over the road anymore, but man, I love sure. your area where I, I didn't realize you still live there. Um, yeah. I thought you were down South. So I thought we had no connections whatsoever, but yeah. Small it's, world. It is a New small, world. small world. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is really is a small world. And then you get social media and it makes it even smaller and you realize how small the world is, but how great and, and, and bait big and amazing and majestic the world is. But man, your, your lessons in patience, that's really something, you know, most guys first buck comes out there hammering that thing, you know, and, and you, you let it go for three full seasons. That's incredible. It was super tempting. I'm not going to lie. It really was. But that day, like I almost could, I'm almost emotional about it right now. Cause I can still like feel how it changed me. And, um, it is something that like there's only a few things in my life that are like so meaningful that literally can get me choked up like this. And that's one of them. And it's just, I think I've come to a point in my life where it's so important to, to know and feel gratitude. And I think when you're so busy with life and you're being a mom and you're being everything other than just you, because there's times in your life that you are that person, it's not about you. Um, and then something comes along that, reminds you that there's something so much bigger than just working and hustling and, you know, being a mom and a sister and a wife and all those things that can just be for you, that can make your soul feel good. And that day that I, like, I seen just the, the turkeys and the dough and the, the fawns playing and then the sunset, and then that buck coming out, like, realizing that I had 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 this beautiful piece of property. And even though I was grateful for it, I was just grateful for it in a different way. But when I opened up my mind to being open-minded, I was able to actually see what I really genuinely had. And it was so much more than just a piece of property. It was an opportunity. It was a stunning gift um, from God that I didn't even realize like that I had. And when I really found the gratitude in that, like it just shifted me in a way that like, I can't even hardly describe to you, but from that minute and that moment, I wanted more of it. And it was like, not because it was um, not work driven, but just simply because it was something that moved me in such a really special way. And it's so strange because I think in those moments uh, for me, I'm a very visual person, but I can literally remember like what I was wearing for camo. I can remember like sitting in there and it was so cold like I could see my breath and I really remember like uh, there was a mouse that literally ran across my boot and I remember thinking to myself oh he's gotta be cold like <laughs> you know and it's weird that I would remember stuff like that but I think when it's in such a when you're so moved by something like you can remember little things and I love that it still makes me feel grateful and thankful and it's just every time I go out and I spend time now in the woods, like that's what I feel. And it doesn't matter if I'm shed hunting or turkey hunting or just going on a hike or four wheeling or in a canoe fishing. Like I remember to be grateful in those times that I have the opportunity to be out in the outdoors, spending time with either my family or people that, you know, bring me joy because I think a lot of times people get so busy with life that they forget to find something that sets their soul on fire. And that's really important. And that's what hunting has done for me. Um, I, you know, my, I went my whole life not knowing what my passion was. And it's like, once you find it, you're just like, oh my gosh, how do I ever live without it? And it, it just, it gets me really excited. And it, it's uh, something that I hope to do for the rest of my life. I'm mad that I didn't get to do it my whole life. I'm like, I missed yeah. out on half of it. <laughs> so now I'm like, I just got to catch up. <laughs> got to do it all. Yeah, I really believe um, that it's it's where we connect deeper in our faith. 
in the outdoors. I think it, I think people sure. miss out on just really being out and what I call God's great outdoors. I'm, I'm, I'm a man mm -hmm. of faith. And so I, I never you. hide from sharing my faith of Jesus, but just being out in the cool, crisp morning air. There's so many mornings where I'm out or evenings that I'm out and I can just feel the air. And I'm like, God, I just feel like you're talking to me. And just to relax because as humans, we don't relax enough. You've, you've mm -hmm. painted a great picture on it. All we, we, we got to hustle, 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 grind, 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 try to get ahead, try to do what the world wants us to do. And, and yeah. live by the world standards instead of God's standards. And he's just telling us, no, just rest. I'll take yes. care of all of it. Just rest. I've given you all this beauty, all this greatness, all this creation to enjoy. And what non hunters don't realize is when we say he's given us all this creation to enjoy, he's given us other humans to enjoy. He's given us animals to enjoy and to enjoy harvesting them as well. Um, it's yeah. hard for a non hunter to really understand that. Um, and of course I'm not, I don't get negative about it or anything like that. I understand yeah. everybody's got different viewpoints and all that kind of stuff, but you, you now understand it, like to, to be able to enjoy every moment of the preparation, the planning, the sitting, the struggle, the sucky mornings where it's freezing cold, the evenings where you see nothing and you're freezing and you're starving and you got to go home and yet do all the mom chores and all the exactly. wife, you know, wife chores, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But then when you get that harvest and you get to all the emotion is, it's like a, an adrenaline dump, all the emotion comes out. There's been animals that I have literally broken down after mm -hmm. I have harvested them. Like, cause all the emotion wrapped up in it. And it's not like, oh, I feel like I'm successful. It's just like, there was so much in this. I, God, I'm so overwhelmingly happy. And then you get to bring it home and eat it and enjoy it with your family yes. and know you're eating what God created. I mean, there's so much greatness about the outdoors. So I just really feel like you said, it's a place to truly connect with our creator um, in a deep, deep level. And my, my pastor said this to me. I used to meet with my pastor every week. And he said, JP, if I watch your, your social media, he goes, I really believe hunting is what makes your soul sing. And I'm like, oh, that's a good way to put it. Like when you said, I connected with something I'm super passionate about. Yeah. Give me every bad day hunting, but still they're all good. They're all really good. They really are. And you're right. And and um, I always kind of giggle at myself because you see all these posts on social media about the women that are giving their hubbies a hard time about hunting. And, you know, that's your last gun you're going to buy, right? Like I used to be that girl. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh. When can we buy a new gun or like, oh, we go buy that next gun. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and can we go again? Let's go. And uh, I, so I was laughing at myself because I, I probably really was that person. Like, you know, it, that didn't understand. And that's what I really was trying to portray when I said, it's about mindset. I wasn't willing to be open-minded at that point to try something new. But when my kids were really just excited about it and they would ask me to come and I've, I'm like ah you can go with dad I was just like I'm robbing my own self of joy to spend that time with my kids and I'm like instead of forcing it like I'm just gonna you know you can't beat them join them but instead joining them like was the biggest gift of ever of anything and it all came from being open-minded to trying so I've you know I've always been um, you know a strong believer that you know, it all starts with, I will try. And if you're willing to try, you might like it, you might love it and you might not, but if you don't try, you never know. So I'm just so thankful that I was open-minded and decided to try it. But I really genuinely feel it was because I, you know, I wanted to be um, an interactive mom, you know, not the one that just missed all the good stuff, you know, and I don't have any girls. So I'm like, I'm going to figure this out. And I'm so glad that I did. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad you did too. I'm glad you did too. Do you think a little bit, um, if you're a goal oriented person, like you said, you are, mm -hmm. if you enjoy some challenges that once, like you said, give it the, I try, I will try. Yes. Once somebody does, you start to realize like in the hunting world, there's a lot of strategy there's, it's very cerebral and there's a lot of challenges and there's goals mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff that, that can be a reason why like, oh, wow, this isn't just go sit and freeze and suck. Like some people would think yeah. it is. I had a friend of mine said, how can you sit in a tree for two hours? Doesn't that suck? I'm like, every minute of it is amazing. Every minute. Yeah, of I was it just going to say, not even for a little bit. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, you know, because I'm goal oriented, I'm driven. I, I want to be successful. I want to overcome challenges. Do you think there, um, in your world, that that kind of drew you once you saw it? It kind of it kind of pulled you in more. For sure, 
For sure. And um, I feel like it's comparable to any goal that you're working towards, no matter what the goal is, because it's never, if it's easy, it's not really a goal at all. And, um, and I've, I have always been a goal driven person ever since I was younger. And I think for me, um, knowing that I, I don't have the skills, I don't have the ability, but I have the mindset that I'm going to figure out a way. Um, sometimes it takes me a really long time to achieve it, but I feel like once I finally get there, once I make it to the goal, it inspires me to want to do the next one because I figured it out. I found a way. I didn't give up. I tried it. And it's not always easy. Like you got to go through, this didn't work. This really was difficult. This was a challenge. Okay. This made it a little bit easier figuring it out what it is and that's how it is with when you're learning how to hunt I there was a million times I made a lot of really silly mistakes that if I had been a little bit more educated um you know when you shoot a deer and you're you shoot a buck and there's 13 I my land's very plentiful so normally when there's deer out there's a ton of doe and a couple of bucks but when you shoot one they all go in a million different directions you know and you're like oh Oh my gosh. And so just little things like paying attention on where did that buck go and which direction and not trying to get overwhelmed with all the other commotion that's happening in your heart about to explode out of your chest anyways. But learning all of those little mistakes, um, there's a lot of things to learn, makes it so much more rewarding when you do have that successful hunt. But the cool thing is, is that when you do have that successful hunt, you generally don't ever make another stupid mistake like you did maybe the first time or the second time, because you're like, that was so brutally painful. I don't ever want that to happen ever again uh, to me or to the, to the animal. And so you generally learn pretty quickly. And I feel like that's when your learning curve starts and when you can start to overcome those things. So it's just like on a personal goal, when you achieve that goal, you're like, well, I learned all the mistakes already in that aspect. So I got that covered. Okay, next thing. And I think it just has a lot to do with personal growth. And, you know, it took me half of my life to realize that personal growth is not terrifying, it's exciting and um, rewarding. And, you know, when you fear things, that's a, a good way to not want, that you can't grow generally. So when you're stepping out of fear and into faith and trying new things, I feel like that's when um, opportunities for personal growth can come. And that's how you can, um, you know, learn more things and try new things, achieve more things, and then continue to, to grow. So to the long answer, yeah, I absolutely think that that has a lot to do with it for sure. But it's almost slightly, I don't know, maybe it's not addicting for everybody, but I think when you are a goal-oriented person, it's just like, what's next? And I don't mean it in like a greedy way. It's just something my soul craves because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm an adventurous person. I like to try new things and I'm probably going to suck at a lot of them, but I'm, I'm okay with that because I want, I want to try them and I want to experience them. But I know that um, if, it's, it's, if it's something that really sets my soul on fire, I'll want to keep trying it and doing it again or trying something similar. But yeah. Oh, it's a bit, <laughs> it's, it's a bit addicting. I think for most people, it's quite a, we get quite obsessive over it, you know, and you couldn't have picked a more expensive hobby. That's for sure. And and, uh, but, that. <laughs> but you have a tremendous mindset, uh, a mindset that obviously even outside of the hunting world is going to, is going to bring just nothing but great success to you with, I mean, when you start talking about personal growth and all that, that's some of my favorite things to discuss and personal growth and self-development. And obviously I want to, I'm going to lay it all on the Lord, but I need to, he feeds the birds, but he doesn't put the worms in their mouth. We've got to be, we've got to go to work and we've got to push ourselves and overcome. You've learned some overcoming um, in your Idaho hunt, spending the night with nothing. I mean, how was that? Yeah cold really cold <laughs> really bet. cold but I, i'll tell you so how was your mindset in that i mean any fear creep in did some fear creep in uncertainty anything like that it did and i'll just kind of paint the picture for a second so that day um so <laughs> i was that day was actually mother's day believe it or not so the reason I was on the bear hunt, first of all, I'll just backtrack, is I had went through a very, very, very long divorce, long divorce. It took me a very long time to get through the divorce. And so at the end of the divorce, um, I knew that I needed something to 
remind me that I was still alive on the inside and that I still had it in me to get after the goals that I had originally set, which is why I left my marriage in the first place. And one of the reasons. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do something that I've always wanted to do, which is a spot and stock bear hunt. And so I had an awesome opportunity uh, present itself to me that I was able to utilize. And so that it just happened to be when I booked the hunt, I didn't realize it was on mother's day, like mother's day. Are you kidding me? Like I would don't, I would never in my whole life ever want to be away from my kids on mother's day. So that's usually what kids do or bad husbands do is right? they're hunting on mother's day, not mom's hunting on mother's I know, day. <laughs> exactly. I know. But I also kind of look at it as it was like kind of just a special uniqueness and I'll tell you why. So, so that day when we got up super early and um, we started at the bottom of the mountain and we, we actually, it was a two hour hike. And so we glassed, we got up there, we glassed and uh, we didn't see anything. We were up there for quite a while. So we're like, okay. So we took two hours, went back down the mountain, got back to the mountain, went around to the other side and glassed from down there. And sure enough, literally right where we just were two hours before there was two black or a black bear and a cinnamon. And so my guide, you know, we're tired. And my guide's like, he looks at me. He's like, well, we got a choice here. What do you want to do? I'm like, I came here to get a bear. Let's, let's go. And he's like, woman, <laughs> I think he was like, for real. And uh, I'm like, oh, let, let's do it. I came here to get a bear. And he's like, dang girl. So off the mountain, we went again. Um, so we got back up there and it took us probably by the time we had to go, it was literally like almost a three hour hike to get back to where we needed to be. And then we got on them and long story short, by the time we finally got on the bear, it was like nine o'clock at night, but it was a full moon. So it was super bright. And then um, I'm thinking that the cinnamon must've been the girl and the, bear, the boy must've been the black bear because when we finally got up there, the cinnamon was gone. And the black bear was almost like it was on I don't know, it was crazy. It was back and forth, back and forth, look, looking for her everywhere, but it wasn't going very far, but it just kept going back and forth. And so I couldn't get a shot on him. He would not stop. Like he was really seriously trying to find her. And so it was like 945 when we finally were like, okay, it's 945. Now we've got, you know, three and a half hours to get back down to the mountain, another two hours to get around to the side. And, you know, we would have had about a six hour hike to get back to where we started. And so at that point, we'd been hiking for 13 hours. And so my legs were honestly giving out like every six steps, like my knee would give out. And then, so it was just becoming like, okay, this is not good. Trying to get off this mountain in the dark after 13 hours, it was just like, we had to make a decision. We either need to just pitch a fire and stay the night or try to get, you know, it could have been worse trying to get off of it in the dark. And um, so we decided well, that we were just going to take the last 15 minutes of daylight that we had and we collected as much firewood as we could. And um, we honestly, all we had left to eat from the day was one of those very small cans of like chicken salad and it had like two crackers with it. <laughs> and so he had one cracker and I had the other one. And um, he went down and got us some water, my guide did, and that was it. Like, so from 10 o'clock until the sun came up, it was just very very cold, like the fire would go out like every 25 minutes. So you'd kind of nod off and try to sleep while the other one would watch the fire. And we just kind of took turns, but it was so cold, even with that fire. And we didn't have anything. We didn't have nothing other than just what we were wearing. And um, and so as fear, yeah, got into me. We were just surrounded by two, two bears. And uh, although I had a weapon, it still was really intimidating. But what was cool about it is that when I was laying there like shivering, what felt like to death and like looking up in the sky, the sky was just so, so mesmerizing. There was just, it was full of stars. And I just had to take a minute and like embrace that because it was Mother's Day. Who, how many mothers could say they're on the top of a mountain on Mother's Day with a bonfire and the just most stunning sky you've ever seen in your whole life? I mean, I went from feeling cold to freezing cold to feeling so blessed and so thankful and so excited to be there. Like just having that experience, like it took everything of like the pain of like being cold and miserable on the top of a mountain, freezing, no food, hungry, cold, kind of afraid. I, 
you know, it took all of that away. And I just felt peace and um, thankfulness. And I think like when you can feel that instead of the elements that you're surrounded with, you can put yourself in a state where there's nothing to fear and nothing to worry about because what a stinking awesome experience. Like no, not many people get to say they've done that. And I feel blessed that I, I got to. So, but uh, the next day, you know, we got down and it was like, oh, it was a rough next morning. So we did, um, we went back and we took a probably a longer nap than, <laughs> than necessary, but it was needed. But we got back up and um, we went out that later in the afternoon and, and did it all over again. And, and so it just, it was, um, it was a really, really challenging, emotionally challenging hunt, but it's so cool just when it all comes together, like on a mountain, just the fact that literally we found the bear at the last day and thank God my guide knew what he was doing. And, you know, I mean, he was awesome, like genuinely awesome. And so he was And the cool thing is, is like, he was so thankful and excited and, and proud of me that we didn't give up. He's like, he even admitted, he's like, I was ready to give up like on day four. Cause it was just so miserable out there. And so, um, it, that just makes it even more exciting. I mean, it's really no fun if no one's proud of you, you know, <laughs> Other than what yourself. an adventure, what you an know? adventure. Yeah. When you look yeah. back up that mountain and he found those bears two hour hike back up and you're like, yeah, I came to get a bear. And he's like, woman, he probably, you know, I, I, women are tough for the men. There's just, there's no question. But, I mean, you give birth, you, you know, so <laughs> you should probably tell every guide when you guide a woman who's given birth, don't look back up the top of the mountain and wonder if she's going to go. That's like nothing right. compared to what you're going to do. You're going back up that mountain. That's exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Congratulations yeah. on that too. Thank That's you so really much. I'll have to. I'll have to send you a picture of the berries. Beautiful. Yeah, I definitely will. I'll post it when we, when we, uh, blast this out. We'll definitely we'll awesome. post that. So are you, do you identify as a gun hunter or an archery hunter? Do you do both or one? I are do you both. Yep. Okay. No, I, I do both. Um, I've been archery hunting, um, probably half the amount of time that I have been rifle. And, um, I seriously cannot tell you, I really think I like bow hunting a little bit better but I love them both. So it's a tough call, but I really love the intensity of being, having the ability to be so close, whether it's um, a doe or a buck. Uh, I've never personally ever harvested a doe before. I, I don't, I have a super soft heart. And so for some reason, I just can't pull the trigger on a doe. I don't know what that's all about. I think it's probably just a mom but you thing. You go I ahead guess. and kill them men, no problem, right? Oh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't identify like that, but I do identify. I'm like kidding. I'm like. kidding. <laughs> um, but even just to have, you know, doe come, they'll literally come right underneath your tree. And a lot of them, they don't even know that you're there and just being able to see that and all the little fun critters that just cruise around in the woods, just being so close. And, you know, it's funny. Sometimes you'll be on a tree stand and like a squirrel will climb right up your ladder and not even know that you're up there and they'll get up at the top and they're like, what? <laughs> So I don't know, just all those fun experiences. And then plus just, just like, you can literally just hear them chewing on grass. Like you can't do that when you're in a stand rifle hunting. I mean, you can, but chances are that, you know, they're not going to come that close. So for me, I, I really, really, really enjoy that a lot. But um, I, so I wouldn't say I'm, I'm one or the other, but I do enjoy both of them for sure. And I do love to just shoot archery. Um, I think that's a great way to, it's, it's just a great way to also teach you patience. I think I shot so much. I gave myself tennis elbow and both arms a couple of years ago. So I had to take it easy um, for the next couple of seasons, but I don't know. It's, it's something that I really, really enjoy. I go to Bowfest every year. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but no. it's, um, it's in uh, Lake Superior and it's just a huge weekend full of bow hunters and they have um, hundreds of acres, but they have four massive courses that all have 3d targets and they're all set at different really tough ones, some mediocre, but, um, so everybody just comes and pitches a tent or brings their camper. And then you go do your archery shoots. And then in the evening they have huge concerts and booths. And, um, so it's just a weekend full of fun and camaraderie and just a really great time. It's an awesome experience. So I really enjoy doing that. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't say I'm one or the other, but I, I do enjoy both. Yeah. Just love the outdoors. You know, one yeah. of the things, um, I talk about this on probably every podcast, 
all the statistics show that the number of hunters were getting less and less the hunters in the outdoors than, than we ever have been. And I don't know where that's coming from because where I hunt, there's more and more. I think archery is growing because there's this, the, the social media influencers have done a great job of showing it as a sport, as a, a elite athlete, you know, and, and, and feeding yourself. And you, you take a look at like Joe Rogan and the Cameron Haynes as they, yeah. they have such huge reaches that they're getting mm-hmm. so many people. It's great. But the one area that is growing in the outdoors is female. That's Agreed. growing more than anything else. What's it like to be um, a female in the outdoors? I mean, do, do you find scrutiny? Do you see um, prejudice or anything like that? I think it's awesome. I, we want, I want more men, women, children in the outdoors because we need a bigger voice yeah. to fight against those that don't like our lifestyle. And uh, I don't sure. care who it is. I just want good, high quality character people like yourself that are in it, that are passionate about it. Right. I don't know so much about um, the scrutiny piece of it um, because I feel like uh, my circle of people for the most part know that I love the outdoors. I know I've got a lot to learn. I know I'm not perfect at it, Um, but I feel like if there's ever anything that I'm saying or that I'm posting and somebody doesn't agree with it, you know, they're kind enough to say, oh, well, maybe try this or do that versus it being like an attack where there, I know that there are a lot of of that going on out there. But for the most part, um, no, I feel very welcomed in it. And I do agree within the last couple of years, it has been just a tremendous change and growth in the women and young girls coming into this industry or just into the outdoors in its entirety. And so, um, in fact, um, a good friend of mine, Angie Gady, she's writing a book right now. And it's, um, it's called, I think, um, zero to a hundred, I think some women in the outdoors, I don't know exactly what the title of it is, but um, she's writing a book on a hundred women. So from zero to a hundred that have hunted. And the goal for the book is really to inspire other girls and women that have never hunted to hear other stories of how people got into it. People that didn't have mentors, people that wanted mentors, you know, just their experience of what they got out of it, what joys they came from it. And so she's really doing something really special to, to help encourage more girls and women to get into the outdoors. And so I'm really excited, um, you know, to, to help her and to be a little bit a part of that process as well. So she's doing something really extraordinary. I kind of dropped your volume a little bit there. Did anything change on your end? No, no. Oh, okay. It's just not picking it up as good. I'm excited to read that book. That'll be a great book to read yes. when it's make sure you uh, promote that out. So what's next on your hunting? What's next on the checklist? What do you, what, what's your goal? What's your next animal goal? Mm-hmm. Uh, I definitely want to my next one and oh, is a mountain lion. I'm not sure how I'm going to accomplish that one yet, but it's got to happen. Like I've been trying to manifest that one for a while. So yeah, my friend Angie and I, we want to do it together. And so we, we both like to have uh, pictures of them on our phones so that we can constantly stay focused on what we're trying to accomplish. So I'm hoping that could be a really cool woman's hunt, the two of us to do that together. So that's the plan, literally, like that is the plan. So um, I went to Idaho last year. I, um, I took my son, my youngest son, he was, um, I took him for his 18th birthday. And so we were supposed to go elk hunting. And unfortunately, the elk tags had sold out like within like 48 hours. So the guy who was guiding us was um, in charge of getting those. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. So he ended up getting us mule deer tags. So we didn't get one. But what's so cool about it is that we spent a f- you know, five days, I think, out there, seven. And it was so stunning. The experience was awesome. It was time for me to, you know, to have that time with my son. Um, you know, before he graduated school. And, you know, we've had the, a great opportunity to, to be, to try different things, go different places. And he said, you know, of all the different places we've visited over the years, um, that, that trip was like one of his absolute favorite. And we didn't even come home with anything. And so that to me was really special and really rewarding. And um, for his 17th birthday, I took him to Texas and we went hog hunting and it was just him and I And it was just really super cool because I was in camp with 17 other men and it was just me, the only girl. And there was room, everybody ate at, you know, in the dining hall and there's just these big tables in there. And it was unique to hear other adult men say to my son, like, 
you have no idea how much I would have given to go on a hunt like this with my mom, but that would have never been an option or never an issue or a situation. So they all kind of gave him the advice, like, I'm sure you're probably here thinking, oh my God, I'm here with my mom, but they're like, consider the fact like I would have given anything to have this experience. And so it just was really cool to hear other people's perspectives on me being there with my son, you know, it's just the two of us. And so that was really cool. So from that aspect to your question, like, I didn't feel like I was out of place. I felt like I was there to hunt too. And um, so it was just really cool to, to hear other people's opinions. And we didn't ask for them. They just were like so taken the fact that it was just the two of us there coming from Wisconsin, traveled to Texas. And um, so it was really cool. It was really, really, really nice. Well, I think those guys understand, as, as I do, um, the connection to the outdoors and the connection you have with the people that you spend time with. I, you know, I have three children. My daughter doesn't hunt yet. She just had a friend over yesterday, and, and my daughter's friend is... 12 or 13, like my daughter and her family hunts. And she, my daughter's friend hunts all the time. So I said to my daughter, her name is Gianna. I said, do you want to hunt? And she's like, mm, I, I don't, I don't really know. So, you know, I hunt with my boys cause she's not really sure if she wants to yet, but the connection, like what those men were saying in that Texas hog camp where they're understanding the connection your son is having now with you in the outdoors. Cause there's nothing like you said before, nothing in the world that's ever going to give us that connection. I know. Uh, my son just yeah. killed his first elk last weekend <clears throat> on Sunday. Yeah. And of course he's all, you know, he's cool and ice water, you know, he, he didn't have like any kind of adrenaline fever. He did say he got a little nervous on that one, but normally he's just really calm and cool and, I'm about ready to cry and break down. I'm like, oh man, I'm just, when he shot his first deer, a few years ago, I shot a little coos deer up in his room, shot a nice coos deer. And it was the first animal he ever harvested. And I, we took school off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I remember I swatted him on the butt and I squeezed him. Yeah. He was, he was 11 and I squeezed him. And I'm just like, oh, I mean, I'm just like a mess. Like I'm so excited about it. He looked at me, he goes, dad, does this mean I have to go back to school tomorrow? And I'm like, no, you don't have to go to school. You're off. Eat all the junk food you want. We're just going to have a yeah. blast camping and, and do everything. So that's why they're saying that. They understand the connection you and your son got to have. And I, I love know, that. I love yeah. it. it's, it's incredible. I, we, we talked some, about some elk. Um, we talked to your UI. You, I thought maybe elk was on your list. Um, it is. I've already accomplished that goal, though. So I am. Uh, oh, that's right. Oh, you just said you wanted to hunt Arizona elk. Yes. Yep. So the first elk that I ever harvested actually was in um, a 2000 high fence. It was the first time ever and only have ever hunted um, a, a high fence. And um, I um, I didn't even go there to hunt elk. I went there, um, I was writing an article for um, that actual outfitter. I was writing for a magazine. And so, um, so I went there to hunt an actual buck. And when we got there, it was so funny. I had harvested the buck and it was just like one of those magical moments. Like it was snowing and it was cold and everybody was ending the night. We were all excited. And the, it was a full moon again and it was pretty dark. And like, um, I remember turning and I can, I'm a visual person, so I can see it in my eyes, but like it was snowing, but the, the moon was coming down and there was like this really super high Valley. And all of a sudden, like this, big massive elk just comes hustling slowly over that and I didn't know they had elk there I mean like at all and so I was not expecting to see an elk and I was just like oh my gosh what is that and the guide said that's your elk and I'm like say what no <laughs> he goes, I think you should harvest that elk and I'm like I think you're right because I had an elk on my uh to go my my goal list so what had happened is another hunter a couple of months prior to that had wanted to hunt an elk so he had brought one in and he has this ton thousands of acres i think it was like two or five thousand acre um fenced in farm and so when he got there he had seen a monster massive buck and so he changed his mind he wanted to shoot the big buck and he didn't want the elk anymore so here he was stuck having this big elk on his property and he's eating up all of his food. And he's like, he's costing me more money to keep him here. He's like, if you want him, I'll just, it'll be, you know, super reasonable. And so I'm like, it took me like 1.1 second to say, yes, I'm in, you're right. That's my elk. And so uh, we went in and then um, went to bed. And then the next day, that whole new hunt and ex 
ex super exciting experience how it happened again, even though it was an in fence hunt. I mean, it was still on thousands of acres of land. So it wasn't just like we walked up and, you know, finished the deal. It was a hunt, um, but it still isn't, wasn't exactly the experience that I, that I am envisioning. So that's why I still have the elk on my, my list. So, so yeah, but, um, but it was super awesome. And I'd never even eaten elk before. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope my kids like it. I hope I like it. Cause we're gonna have a whole bunch of it. And thank God it, that is the best meat I've ever hands down ever ate. It is so amazing. Like, oh, I wish I had some right now. <laughs> Uh, elk is so good and we prepare it so many different ways we had it the other we had it two nights ago i did the tenderloin i, I took the tenderloins mm -hmm. out and we did uh, my wife made tenderloin stir fry so typically what we do so our kids all eat it i get most of it turned into burger yeah a ton of burger and then we do brats i'm from wisconsin you know yeah. kind of off of people brats are like brat i've never heard what of a brat that? i'm like you guys <laughs> You got to come to Wisconsin and get the best brats. So we get brats made and then all the whole back straps I stake out. And then typically when we cook those, um, we'll marinate them and then we'll grill them and then strip them and then make them into fajitas. So we eat it as uh, fajitas. It is, I mean, all of our friends that come over that are like, I don't know if I could eat wild game. They go crazy over it. It's so I good. It. I mean, it's, it so is. Good. yeah, well, it genuinely is. yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get you down to Arizona. You'll, you'll get a chance to hunt down here. It's a, a mecca of wildlife. So many great opportunities. We were talking before we got on the podcast. We won't go through it again, but so many great opportunities to hunt down here. Multiple animals. Javelina, you got to come hunt Javelina. Put it on your list. If you okay. want to bow hunt and bow hunt an animal, Javelina is the animal you want to bow hunt. Because right. they're fun. One. They're a bow hunter's dream. If you find them, you can typically, I love them because it's like success rate. Yeah. If you find them you're typically going to get in them within 30 yards and get a shot at them with a bow. Yep. So they're made to bow hunt. The mule deer down here are world-class elk are world-class. Every animal we have in Arizona is world-class. There's so many over the counter opportunities to hunt here. And it's all, public. you know, people typically from Midwest or the East don't, if they don't really understand the West, they, you understand the West. Now I always get the question. So is it, you just hunting public land or private land? It's all public. It's yep. all national forest, BLM land, state land, everything. You have some chunks of private, but you just go around it. Nobody lets you hunt their private. Right. Hundreds of millions of acres of, of, of public land. And we got to fight for that as well. We always got to fight to keep public land. But yeah, let's talk about your newest endeavor. And I don't think it's very new. I, I, I don't know a whole lot about it. But when I talked to Art Helen, so, and I hadn't talked to him forever. He called me out of the blue and I'm like, oh, okay. Maybe he's looking for some business. You know, I have my other business that I do, maybe he's looking for some help or something. I'm not sure. And he goes, I need you to connect with the, this, this friend of mine, Dana. You got a really, really neat opportunity and with your podcast. I really would like to see her on there and get exposure. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. And so you and I connected mm -hmm. and it's been a little while, but now here we are. Finally, we're, right. we're connected and we got it down. So tell me about hunting yeah. for connections. I'm really excited yeah. to know more about this and what you're doing with it and, and what it's what it's achieving and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So earlier in the conversation, I had mentioned that um, I went through a divorce. Well, at that time when I was married, we had just over 500 acres um, that was private. And so I knew that in that divorce, I was going to be receiving some of it. We had three different chunks. One had 300 acres, one had 73, and one had 130. And so I knew it's somehow that was going to get divided. But at that time, I provided for our family financially, and then my ex-husband took care of our properties and taxes and all those other things. And so um, when it came to hunting time, he took care of the land. He got everything ready. I would just roll up and hunt because I was working 12 hours a day. And so when the divorce came and I knew I was going to get some of that land, I'm like, oh, I need to learn how to take care of this land because I haven't had to up until this point. And so I was just in a really a bit of a situation. And so I'm like, where am I going to get the answers? I got to learn how to, when do I do food plots? What kind do I do? What kind of equipment do I need? How do I keep big bucks coming to my property? I didn't know any of that. And so I didn't want to just start randomly asking questions on Facebook. And um, my day job, which is I'm a headhunter by day in the financial services industry, I have learned over the years the power of connection and like how many awesome opportunities can come when you connect like-minded people. 
And so I thought, all right, I'm going to start a Facebook group. And I'm like, I want it to be different than any other group, but I want it to be a place that I can ask questions or other people can ask questions. But I also want it to be a place where people can find opportunities that they wouldn't generally be able to find elsewhere or wouldn't necessarily have access to. And at that time when I was going through a divorce, I, I love to hunt out West and going through a divorce is very expensive. And so I'm like, how can I hunt out West on the dot, you know, on a dime. And so I'm like, well, I bet you there's a lot of people or some people that would want to hunt Wisconsin that's never hunted Wisconsin. So I'm like, well, maybe I can swap a hunt. So I'm like, all these ideas were coming into my head. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to start this Facebook group with the intention that I want to bring like-minded people together. I want some unique opportunities to come together for people. And I want to be able to swap hunts and ask my questions. So I just started thinking of different names and I decided I'm going to call it hunting for connections. And at that time I had four different ideas on what I wanted to come from the group. And so um, I started the Facebook group and it just started to grow. And as it started to grow, um, I never told anybody I was going through a divorce and I would just ask my questions and people were so willing to give me the information that I needed. And it was all coming from people that already knew the answers because it was a community full of hunters and fishermen. And so as time went on, I um, started posting in there that I wanted to swap hunt. I wanted to go out west, which is how we ended up going last year. They um, had come and hunted um, my property, and then they hosted us out there. And so um, that didn't cost us anything, you know. And so it was a great way to be able to, to help each other without it being paying an outfitter's fee. And so um, then what I, I started to do is I thought, you know, I'm going to let, I want to be a group that is different than other groups. And so we started letting people that had outfitters or charter fishing trips actually promote in the group. So they could say, you know, I've got a hunt here or whatever, but they had to offer a discount so that they could promote for free, but they would be giving some value to the members. So a lot of times if they had somebody that would cancel, instead of just letting it cancel, they could throw it in the group you know, and say, you know, here's 40% off or 50% off, because I'd rather get 50% of it than nothing, because I want, you know, if somebody can do it. And all these um, different outfitters just kept posting. And pretty soon, I was just getting all these messages from people saying, oh, my gosh, you know, I love this group. Like, I just got to experience this awesome hunt with my son or my daughter that I would have never been able to go to had you not allowed them to post here or this opportunity came about or you know it was just really becoming something special which is what's special to me is bringing you know good people together and you know helping helping people and so pretty soon it just it just started to grow and and it snowballed and just so many amazing things have come from that group and we're up to I think almost 33 or 35,000 active members and it's a very active group and so it's a place where you can, you know, just be who you are and, and promote who you are and, you know, um, share your experiences. But um, it's just, it's a fun group because I do allow people that are either hunters or fishermen to promote either if they have a unique product, but they just have to offer a discount. Same thing for outfitters and fishing charters. They can come on there and, and promote for free, but they just have to offer that discount. So that's really cool. But for me going through a divorce, my divorce lasted over three years. So it was a really long time. But during that time, that group was growing and goodness was coming from it. And so, um, you know, I had swapped those hunts. And so it was just a place for me to surround myself with people that I could share my passions with and, and not have to tell anybody what was going on in my personal life and still just have a warm, willing, kind people surrounding me. And, you know, just when you're around things that make you feel good. It, you just, it's a, it's a great outlet for when you're going through something really difficult. But during that entire time that we were building the group, um, I started working on, um, on a business that I had actually, um, thought about, um, before I actually left and, and went through that divorce. So, um, when I was 19 years old, way back then, I said, one day when I turned 40, I'm going to build a domestic abuse safe house in La Crosse to honor my mom's struggles with domestic violence. And so I'm like, okay, I'm now 40 years old. It's time, like it's time to do this. 
And I'm like, well, I'm starting over completely over in my life. So how am I going to do that? Right. So as you know, I'm a goal, um, goal oriented person. So I'm like, well, I'm starting completely over. So if I'm starting over, I'm going to figure this out. So I knew that in order to help me fund this domestic abuse safe house, I needed to launch a business that would allow me to help others give back to the outdoor community somehow, but also just really strive to make a difference. But that could help create a financial stepping stone to help me um, be able to fund and get the domestic abuse safe house started. And so I really, I don't know how to describe it to you, but for about a year, I had, I, oh, it's, you know, you may, you probably know. So my whole life, I always said, I always wondered what, like, what it felt like to have God speak to you. I never knew what that felt like, right? I never knew it, what that was like. And so I was just, would always pray, like, just talk to me, tell me I don't get it. Like, I've never experienced that until I finally experienced it. And for a year, I would wake up every day. Like I knew in the pit of my stomach, in my every ounce of my soul, in my complete being that I was supposed to be doing something different, that I was supposed to be launching a business that would help lots of people. And I didn't know what it was. Like it was making me crazy. I couldn't figure it out. I would literally, I went to psychics. I went to the Bible. I went to everywhere I could possibly figure it out. And um, finally, what I did is I just, um, I just continued to pray. And I kept praying. I'm like, just show me what you want me to do. Tell me what you want me to do. And it was unique because as I'm praying for the answer, I'm getting all these Facebook messages from people saying, how do I meet a girl like you? Like, literally, how can I meet a girl like you? Do you have a sister, a cousin, a friend, a mother, an aunt? Like they weren't hitting on me inappropriately. They just were like, I, I, how do I find somebody like you? Somebody that will spend time with me in the outdoors. And those messages just kept coming and coming and coming. And I, I look back now and I just, I'm like, oh my goodness, I give myself the V8 test because I've been praying for the answer on what am I supposed to be doing? And it was consistently coming to me. I just wasn't seeing it. So, um, so pretty soon one day, this guy says to me, I just want somebody to share my lifestyle with and within that one comment this light bulb of explosion went off in my head and I'm like holy smokes why is there not a dating site for people who love to hunt fish and spend time in the great outdoors and so I went to the website or went to the web and did research and found that there wasn't one like that but there was one for every other niche out there and so I just decided to really combine my passion and you know take away what i walked away from with knowledge from you know getting out of a marriage and you know i incorporated my desire and my goal for wanting to to help others and to make a difference and i thought you know if i could change people's lives by promoting healthy relationships built strong in the outdoors there's nothing better than that because i learned what it feels like to find your passion and i learned it i'm getting emotional um, I learned it in the outdoors. So it's like, that's like such a true testament that like, that can change your life. Like the light, the outdoor lifestyle can like literally change your life. And I'm like, I want more people to feel that and experience it. Not even if it's with hunting, but anything. Um, one second. You because probably don't know this, but I'm like ultra emotional. So behind my glasses, I'm already teared up. So <laughs> this, is, this is super awesome, Dana. Um, so I'm like, I want more people to feel that and to find that. Like, and I thought if I can inspire people to try, just to try something new and to be open minded to getting in the outdoors, when you're with somebody that is an outdoor enthusiast, you're more willing to try something new because they're into it. You're like, I'll generally I'll try it. And I just thought, you know, if I can impact more people by trying new things in the outdoors being in the outdoors that's how you can really get to know somebody you can see how they interact if they get angered easily if they're frustrated if they're aggressive if they're mean if they're kind if they're gentle all those things you you learn when you're out and about doing something you know spending that time with somebody and whether it is just doing whatever it is in the outdoors it could be anything for that matter but you know when you can create that foundation of friendship first 
like that can seriously be the starting pivotal point of actually building a healthy relationship and coming from a childhood of not healthy relationships, a 20 year marriage of not a healthy relationship. That's super important for me to promote healthy relationships built strong in the outdoors. And that's where you can really get to know somebody. And so we really knew that we wanted to launch an online dating and friending site that would allow people to come together through shared hobbies and passions with a, with a really genuine desire to create those healthy relationships, but also to help people find a passion. When I spent 30 years of my life not having one it, to finding one, it changed my life forever. It inspired me in such a way that I didn't ever want to spend another day not feeling the way that I felt once I found it. And when you find that passion, like nothing, like there's nothing that can beat that. And everybody in their whole life should not go without knowing what that is. And if it's waiting for them to find it, you know, and if you don't ever go out and try it, you know, people are getting robbed of not knowing what that feels like. And that's a big deal. Like finding your passion is a really big deal. And so, um, so I took my idea to my kids, my two boys, and um, they loved it. They loved the idea. They're very passionate about giving back and helping others. And so we said, man, is this like, are we really seriously talking about creating another business? So they said, I, we want to be involved. Like we want to, we want to help you. We want to be involved. We want to do this. And so we sat down and we said, okay, let's write down our goals. If we did this, like, what would we want the outcome to be? And then we wrote them all down. Then we came back together and went through them. Every, all of us, all three of us, every goal on our list was giving back, helping others, what, how we would contribute to the outdoors, how we would, you know, impact the domestic abuse safe house, how we would give back to green energy and all of these great things. Nothing on it came from like a, I'm going to buy a new car or I'm going to do this. It was, everything was about giving back. And we knew in that minute and in that moment, like it was a God given opportunity that we had to seize. And so we made a decision right there that day. Oh, that we were going to seriously try to do something that would make a big difference. And so um, I'd never, never built a dating site. How the heck do you do that? And I'll tell you how you do it by the grace of God. That's how you do it. Because I didn't, I didn't know anything. Like it was a vision, just an idea planted a seed of, you know, it is literally like a faith-based, honest to God, planted seed. And um, I just said, pro- show me the Proverbs, way, like, show me. In the book of Proverbs today, I read the proverb of the day every day, and today is Proverbs mm-hmm. 16, because okay. it's the 16th, and it says, commit to the Lord whatever you'll do, and your plans will succeed. So when you say it is the grace of God, you committed what you want to do to the Lord. That's why you're succeeding. It is, it is the Lord is literally directing your steps. So keep going. I just wanted to tell you that like, you're like, Thank how do you do you. it? Grace of God. Well, you committed you and your kids to what you wanted to do, committed to the Lord and he'll make your plan succeed. And, and it's really a unique story because we didn't have any idea what we were doing like at all. And I'll tell you, you know, they always say fail first. Well, we certainly did that. We got that covered. We ended up hiring just some guy online to create um, the site. And so we spent like a year working with him. And at the end, when we were like literally pretty much done, the site was seriously a train wreck. It was just a a hot mess. I mean, it was not professional. And we're like, oh my gosh, we spent all this time. And we're like, this this is not, this just isn't it. And so we had to make a hard decision. Like we're either going to tank it and just not do it, or we're going to just literally go all in and give it our all and do it the right way. And so we just said, okay, this is, um, you know, we literally, again, turned it over to God and we're like, just help us find what we need to move forward. And, um, and one door after another started to open and, um, believe it or not, I mean, there was a lot of obstacles and hardships and commitment, but it's, I went, uh, strangely enough, for my day job out of town to Arizona. I was in Arizona. No, I was, no, I was in um, Atlanta, excuse me. And um, I met this woman there and it's so crazy because I should say the word magical because it's not even crazy. Um, 
there's a room full of probably 50 people. And for some reason, this woman and I, we just gravitated towards each other. And like, we couldn't stop. We just kept saying like, this is so insane that we've got all these things in common. And she kept saying, there's a reason you're here. There's a reason like why we're connecting and like why this is so easy. And like, we just couldn't separate. Like we didn't want to talk to anyone else in the room. We just had so much to say to each other. Well, that night my flight ended up getting canceled. And so she invited me to have dinner with her and her kids. And so she invited me over and I went over and had dinner with her and we're sitting on her couch and um, we're having a glass of wine. She's like, well, what else is going on other than, you know, we've been talking recruiting all day. And I said, well, I'm, I'm working on um, launching a new business with my kids. And I said, and I said, we're struggling because we really are looking for a, a new developer. And I said, we're building an online dating app. And she literally like went, like spit her wine out and was like what did you just say and she said oh my god I know why you're here I know why you're on my couch I know why your plane got delayed she's like you're never gonna believe this and I said okay tell me she said my stepbrother created the software for match.com and she, yeah exactly she goes, he doesn't work there anymore. He's out on his own. He's very sought after. She goes, I can't promise anything, but I can open up the door and make a connection for you. And then I spit my wine out. <laughs> yes. Got me crying. Like I, I, this is all God's story. All, all divine. It is so seriously special. And so we, uh, I'm like, what? So she did exactly what she said she would do. She made a connection for me. And, um, uh, so the developer and I, we connected, we had a great connection. He said, he goes, I'm actually in the middle of building an app for somebody else. So I can't work with you. He said, but I love your mission and your story. He said, but what I can do is I can mentor you. And, um, so he mentored us for six months, answered any questions, every questions guided us, helped us super genuinely amazing individual. And, uh, about six or seven months later, he finished up that project and took us on as as a, a, a client and um, within seven or eight months, he had us launched and um, it was like ripping a bandaid off because it's terrifying. You know, we'd worked on it for like three and a half years. And so you just, you're praying because you know, like, you know, you're supposed to be doing it. And it's so terrifying. And it's like, why is it terrifying? Like, I know I'm supposed to be doing this. Um, but I don't have any investors. I don't have any um, partners other than my two kids. And so I'm, my day job is funding my dream job. And so it's a lot, that's a lot of pressure. And so it's working two full-time jobs and juggling and networking and making connections. And um, so what I've, what I've been doing is what I found is that when you don't have a huge marketing budget, okay, what's the plan B? How can you, how can you leverage what you do have to get this in front of people? So when we launched, our initial plan was, okay, we've got a small marketing budget. We're going to use it on Facebook and we're going to target state by state by state, get one state, maybe have combined um, like relationships and we can use those as testimonials, go to the next state, so on and so forth. Well, unfortunately, right when we launched, Facebook came out with their, their dating section. And so between that and when you are a dating site, you have to go through an approval process where most other industries don't have to. And so Facebook, they won't approve us to use their app. And so um, in their policies, they one of the things that they say that you cannot utilize if you are a site that focuses on hookups, three-person marriages, mail order brides, or connections. And I have the word connections in the name. So they kind of look at that as like hooking up type of a situation, which is completely not the way that we're utilizing the word connections. But it's very difficult, I'm sure, if you've ever known to try to talk to people at Facebook. So for a year, we haven't had the opportunity to promote the dating site on Facebook. And so we're like, how else are we going to be able to, to promote this? And so we've been leveraging with um, different companies just doing swaps. So for instance, I'll promote them um, on our Facebook page and the Facebook group. Um, and then they'll promote us on their page or their group or whatever they're doing. Or we've connected with some YouTubers where they'll do a shout out for us. And then in exchange, then we'll share their videos. And so it becomes a win-win, helps them get more followers. And um, so when we had originally knew that we were going to start this site, I'd originally bought the domain Hunting for True Love. So that was what the site was going to be called. And after going through all that 
stress of the divorce, but building friendships and having all these people to almost embrace me in a way like um, I was trying to describe before, that the group was very special to me. And um, I'm like, you know, this is crazy because we want, we realized that the dating section, it wasn't like, everybody's not just looking for love. Some people are just looking for new friends. You know, you move to a new area and you don't have anybody that you can now mesh with, um, or maybe you're just looking for an activity partner. And so we knew that we wanted people to be able to match four different ways. So we're like hunting for true love, hunting for, we already had the group called hunting for connections. And I'm like, this would be such a cool way for me to kind of almost honor the group in a way to be able to name the site after the group. And so we decided to also name the group or the dating site. It's a dating and friending site, um, Hunting for Connections as well. And so um, it does get a little bit confusing at, at sometimes for some people at, um, in a minute, but then we just explain it. But we've got two different logos for the group and for the actual site itself. But for me, um, you know, it, it was very meaningful for me to be able to name it after the group, but it also makes sense. It is a perfect name for the site as well. And it's also a great name for the group because they're hunting for connections in there. And, you know, we're hunting for connections on the site as well. So um, we've been launched for just a year and a half now. And um, it's we're growing organically without Facebook, which is exciting. So that's a blessing. I mean, for us right now, we're just working really hard on building the site to get more people in there so that when people come in, there's there are people there for them to talk to. And that's going to take a little bit of time to consistently grow and to grow that, which obviously things like that don't happen overnight because you got to get the word up there. So uh, we're doing different types of marketing and just trying to, you know, allocate different dollars in different areas to try different things to find out what works best. But um, honestly, we've already um, had a few love connections already. So my heart already is like singing so happy. Um, so that makes me so excited. So it's testimony that you know, when you set a goal and you create a vision and you stick to it through all the ups and downs, like, and commit it to, you know, to literally walk in faith with something that you genuinely don't know what the outcome is going to be. You just know that it's what you're called to do and it can honestly come together. And when I think about that at one day, one day, like seven years ago, it was just an idea in my head. And now we legitimately have a website, um, you know, a following people that know the brand, that believe in the brand, and that we are genuinely changing people's lives for the better. Like that's been the initial goal since day one, that the universe will find a way to help you. And I, you know, I have struggles. It's not easy. It's, I'm, I'm a hustler, you know, I'm, I'm working on it all the time. And I know that it will all pay off eventually. And for me, it's not the payoff. It's the end goal to change people's lives for the better, to give back, to make a difference. And at the right time, when it is the right time, I know that the business will eventually create an income, which will then create that stepping stone for me to build the domestic abuse safe house. So I'm just, uh, I'm walking the steps every day. <laughs> I'm in awe, literally just don't even know what to say. Just really, really grateful for what you're doing. I mean, it's Tremendous. You know, the connection to the outdoors, you know what it can do when two people get connected like that. I was going to say, what do you have for, do you have some success stories? And you already do, you already got some love connection stories. That's just tremendous. I mean, just thank you, you know, is all I can really say. And God bless the efforts and everything you can do and anything I can do. I'm fully on board to help promote in any way possible. I mean, I really didn't really know what it was other than when I got your message, like, Hey, I got a, I know you're married, but I got this dating site thing. I just, I think it'd be good to get out. Um, and art Helen told me a little bit about it and I'm like, Hey, I just, you know, just tell our schedules connected, but I'm so glad they connected. So I could, I could know more about it and I can be a promoter of it and a cheerleader for you guys on the, on the sidelines. One of my, you know, green Bay that. Packer fans, one of the Heck yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't even watch pro football anymore, but you're from Wisconsin. So a cheesehead fan, whatever. So you're doing an awesome job, Dana. Really. I'm really, really glad that we got to connect and you get to share the story. Thank you so much. I am too. I just, um, I feel grateful for the opportunity just because there's, there's so much goodness that can come from it. And I realized like there's, 
it takes a while to get there. And I feel like um, it's just a, it's a good learning lesson in life in, in its entirety. I mean, we've been working on this for a long time and it's so easy to give up and it's so easy to want to just say, uh -uh. Um, but when you have it in your soul, you know, there's, there's just, there's no giving up. Like that's just not even an option. So I don't know if, if I can inspire anybody today to just follow your goal and follow your gut because it is, um, it's not always just your thoughts. You know, we're moved sometimes by ways that we don't even know that we're being moved by. And um, it doesn't even matter what your faith or religion is. There's something calling you to do something amazing. Humans are amazing. We have, a, you know, they really can do amazing things when we put our mind to it and put a passion behind it. Well, any closing thoughts? We've been on an hour and a half and I've just oh, I've loved every minute of it. I it's really, been an hour and a half. Oh, yeah, goodness. I really have. I've loved every minute of it and, and hope you. an opportunity to get to meet you in person one day and, you Absolutely. know, share some time in the outdoors. Literally, yeah. you know, when you said, you're like, hey, I want to hunt Arizona. I got a farm, you know, doing the whole swap thing. I'm like, I grew up yeah. in Wisconsin. Just didn't know it was so close yeah. to literally where you are. I've probably That's hunted the same bucks that are running from your <laughs> property over to my property. That's probably, a, that's so probably, like, um, I guess for a closing, all I would say is for anybody that is interested in signing up as a friendly reminder, the site is not just for people that are looking to date. It's also, if you're just looking for a new friend or even an activity partner or a mentor for that matter, um, the site is free to sign up. It doesn't cost anything to sign up. And we are, because we are new in a year in, um, we're, we're giving every new sign up a hundred free tokens, which allows them to come in and talk, um, to check out the site, see if there's people in their area yet. And then if there isn't anyone in their area, they can fill out their, their profile. And then do they just go to notifications, which then um, they can write in there how they want to be notified. So if somebody new does come and sign up in their area, then they'll be notified to say, hey, somebody signed up in your area, come in and check it out. And they still have their hunter free tokens so they can start talking for free. Um, but ultimately, the cool thing is, is that anybody that signs up right now, they are going to be in drawings. We are giving away a whitetail hunt, a shotgun hunt in Illinois. We're giving away a hog hunt in Texas. We're giving a whitetail hunt away in um, a different part of um, Illinois. We've got fishing trips, um, romantic getaway weekends. We have got all kinds of awesome things lined up, set up to give away. Um, we're giving away a signed shotgun from um, world champion Patrick Flanagan. So we've just got amazing things just um, lined up. And all they have to do to, to get into that is sign up and create a profile. A profile takes three minutes tops to, to create it. So it's um it's a really easy process but anyways again it's about changing lives and making a difference and that's what we're shooting to do so hopefully if um anybody is listening and watching and they're interested in um finding a new friend date relationship or activity partner hunting for connections.com is the place to be so hunting for and it's the number four number four hunting yep. the number four connections.com is the dating site is the is yes. the connection site the friend or activity partner site. And then yes. you also have hunting for connections, Facebook page. Yes. And there's a Facebook page and a Facebook group. The Facebook group has nothing to do with dating. If you guys love to hunt or fish, that's, that's the main part of the group. Feel free to join. It doesn't cost anything to join. And you know, it's not, it's nothing to do with dating. So it's, that is a great, great group. Great. Group. Yeah. I'm in that group and great content. And did you just harvest a buck this year? I did. Yeah. So did. you're in there so people can see your, your buck. I'll post it when yeah. I, when I share this podcast and we market this podcast. So yeah, congratulations already. So now you're going you. to travel around. I know it's uh, the first time ever since I've been bow hunting that I got it done the second day opening weekend. And our season was a week early this year. So I thought maybe I'd have a chance to get my first buck in velvet and it didn't happen, but I'm still super excited that I, that I got my buck. So that was, an, I got a nice 10 pointer. So that was really cool. Yeah, it was a beautiful 10 pointer. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think there's gonna be uh I don't think you have too many problems getting more animals lined up. I think, <laughs> I think you can do pretty good. Um, do you have an Instagram page? I do, yes, hunting for connections. And then I also personally have an Instagram page, which is Dana Sasha. Okay, and so, what is S A C you want to spell your last name? Yep. S A C I A. S A C I. And I'll put it in the notes too. So Dana, it's been uh it's really been a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Um, look forward to meeting you in person some days and we're from the yes. same neck of the woods. I know, literally. So, really, really crazy. Um, I'll figure out more people that I know and I'll stay in communication with you who I know that you know. 
Uh, I love that. that don't listen really to any cool. of the story. Don't listen to any of the stories, though. But <laughs> yeah, um, you know how that thank God for God. But uh, <laughs> right. just God bless you and all your efforts <laughs> with you and your, your your sons in your new business. And I don't want to say new business in your business. I just I really pray it thrives. Thank and you so continues much. To grow and and all the connections are made and people find true love and they find true love in the outdoors because it it is um it it's you know I have an amazing wife and she allows me to hunt and I'm excited for her to listen to this because yeah. as, as you're talking and you're talking about the connections of the outdoors and how people have it I know this because I'm in the outdoors as much as possible I'm like you know there's a lot of times I go hunting by myself and our mm -hmm. kids are in school I'm just gonna invite my wife maybe yeah. more often to, hey once you come with this time to come with this time and just see yeah. kind of and experience some of it so she doesn't really Definitely. like it that much but maybe one day just never know. I mean, it happened to me, so it can happen to anybody. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so well, thank, thank you for having me on. Really, genuinely appreciate that so much. Thank you, and God bless you. And we'll we'll uh, we'll talk soon. Okay, Dana. Sounds good. Great Take day. care. God bless you. you. Too.